Haplotype 0 here with Super Fight Series video number 11, Sayers versus Heenan. Uh, in the last video, uh, I did um, Molino versus Crib, which I think is widely, you know, at least <laughs> among, among people who follow the history of boxing, known to be one of the most significant super fights in history. I'd say that Sayers versus Heenan is one that was lost in history. Um, I hazard a guess that very few people um, in the YTBC and you know in the general public even know about this fight uh, or its significance. Um, after I finished the last one, I was sort of searching through you know the archives of of what I could do next. Um, so I didn't want to skip right to, you know, Corbett versus Sullivan and then into the, the gloved era. I think there are still a few significant fights um, among the period between uh, Molyneux versus Cribb until, you know, later in the Marcus of Queensbury rules taking over in America, really taking over boxing. But, um, I sort of went back to the drawing board and, you know, I was looking at my, my, my dude, Nat Langham, <laughs> who some of you may remember from the middleweights debate on 78's uh, Lion's Den channel. Um, and I, I was really looking for something to do for him, uh, but he really didn't have any super fights. The most significant win he had was over a guy, na a guy named Tom Sayers who did have a super fight, actually. One that was almost as much or more significant than any of the other ones I've done so far. And um, the only one I could say is probably equal to it is Molino versus Crib. Um, but getting back in time, uh, Molino versus Crib, after that fight happened, you know, boxing started declining. Like, there wasn't so much interest in it after a while, especially after a guy named Tom Spring became the champion. He was sort of the last of the, you know, sweet science-esque um, um, champions. He was, nickname was the Light Tapper. <laughs> um, but, I mean, he was the last sort of notable guy um, to be scientific in the ring. For a while until these guys came about and uh, his last fight was in 1824 now this super fight happened April 17th 1860 so you can see that there was a long period of time there where you know not much was going on in the British boxing scene and things had devolved devolved into um, bums fighting bums and basically you know two guys standing in front of each other, you know, not moving, and, you know, whoever could last the longest wins, which didn't captivate the public and uh, caused boxing to become highly illegal again. Uh, a lot of fixed fights contributed to that, too. But there was still an interest there. It wasn't dead yet. And if you can sort of imagine, I see a lot of parallels between this period of time and where we're at right now with boxing. Like, people talk about evolution and they imagine this line that's just diagonally going straight up in the air that, you know, boxing always just gets better and better and better. But no, the guys of this era that I'm going to talk about do not compare to the Figs, the Brocktons, the Mendozas, the Richmonds, and the Molinos and the Cribs, okay? Those guys were long gone by this point. This fight is happening a full, you know, 50 years or so after the last super fight I did. Although, in America, there was a, a scene where boxing was increasing in popularity and science, and um, there's even a super fight that I still may go back and do. I'm still not sure about this one. I gotta do more research. But Tom Heyer versus John Ambrose, which uh, harkens back to the Gangs of New York, which is a movie some of you may know that I like, where the Native Americans 
Native Americans, air quotes, uh, fight against the immigrants. Tom Heyer representing the air quotes Native Americans and John Ambrose uh, uh, representing the immigrants. But I digress. Getting back to the subject at hand. So boxing sort of on the rise in America, though it's still the British title is still the de facto world title. Uh, Britain is still synonymous with boxing, you know, even though it's been on the decline for quite some time. Along comes a guy named Nat Langham and another guy named Tom Sayers. Now, these guys sort of revive the sweet science and start drawing a swath of destruction among all the, you know, British fighters of that day. They meet up and Nat Langham uh, is able to defeat Tom Sayers using clever, skillful boxing techniques uh, because if he hadn't, he probably would have easily lost to Sayers who was getting to him. Um, but Langham was able to close his eyes and in the end Sayers had to throw in the towel for the only loss of his entire career. Now, Sayers was 5'8 and 147 pounds. The highest he ever weighed going into a fight on record that I've found is 152. So this is sort of a uh, Barbados Walcott-esque type of guy who goes up and captures the heavyweight title among uh, much, much bigger men. And at the time, and this may sound familiar, during this week period of time, this guy, Tom Sayers, was seen as the greatest fighter of all time. Greatest fighter of all time during this period where everything had turned to garbage. Okay? But these people weren't remembering the Cribs, the Molinos, the Richmonds, the Mendozas, and all that kind of stuff. Something rings similar to what's going on now. I'll leave that up to you guys to figure out and um, if you believe that Tom Sayers was the greatest fighter of all time, even at that point, I strongly disagree with you. However, he was very good. And he was a pound-for-pound -pound type of fighter because he was able to take on guys 40, 50, 60 pounds heavier than him with 3, 4, 5-inch height advantages and I'm sure big reach advantages as well using scientific boxing and um, outsized power, I would say. So getting back to America, John Heenan um, was an Irish, uh, the child of Irish immigrants um, who ended up settling in California and his rise of fame coincided with the rise of the newspaper industry, okay? And this is very significant and also another parallel that can be drawn to today where, you know, we have the rise of the Internet and we see how important that is in the, in the, in the careers of the media hype fighters of today. So, you know, I would say that the rise of the newspaper industry in America was equal if not greater than the significance of the rise of the Internet. That's just my opinion, but it was pretty big either way. Um, this guy was a household name. He had, air quotes, endorsements or butter companies, tobacco companies, and even Kellogg's um, put his face on their packs of flour as being the best, strongest, you know, stuff in the world. Okay, his hairstyle was emulated and little boys cut their hair like him. His, his nickname was the Benicia Boy, and the Benicia was basically an area which would now probably be called the Bay Area. So, you know, if he was out now, he'd probably be called the Bay Area Boy, okay? But he had a huge following there, and all throughout the United States, he, be, he rose to a legendary figure. Now, he had fought for the American Channel uh, Championship against John Morrissey, who was the reigning American champion, but Heenan lost due to an abscess on his leg where he could not continue, but he had been beating Morrissey mercilessly around the ring throughout the entire fight. Morrissey refused a rematch, which um, 
Heenan had been campaigning for big time for quite some time after the fight. Um, and um, Morrissey instead decided to retire because I guess he probably knew he could not win such a fight after he got lucky in coming out with the victory the first time. So he retired and Heenan became the de facto American champion. Heenan was uh, about five, uh, well, I'm sorry, Heenan was about six one to six two, and he weighed anywhere from 190 to 200 pounds um, during his fights. So word starts circulating because of the new emergence of the newspapers in America. Of course, uh, Great Britain already has the newspaper. There are people going back and forth. People are traveling. I believe there was one guy in particular that went from Great Britain to London and had a hand in training Heenan that then sent stuff back to England that said this guy can come beat anybody over there. Uh, but but um, Sayers was sort of achieving this legendary status by beating everything in his path. He was little, yeah, he lost to Nat Langham, but he still looked pretty good in that fight, and he went on to beat much bigger guys um, and ended up becoming the British champion, which was the de facto world title at the time. So then you have Heenan, who can't get a rematch with Morrissey, so he's looking for someone to legitimize his championship. So he looks and he hears about this guy over in England who's the champion, and he wants to fight him. So uh, on April 16th, 1860, John Heenan arrives in England after a long, arduous journey over boats and railroads. Uh, I guess he came from the West Coast, so he went the Asian route, which is even longer, I believe, and arrives in England April 16th, and on April 17th and 7.30 in the morning, he's already at this field to fight uh, uh, Sayers. Talk of this fight eclipsed the talk of the Democratic National Convention in the United States, and Lincoln was advised of this, of... Uh, by um, one of his chief advisors, and this was a convention that paved the way to the Civil War, so it's pretty significant, okay? So on both sides of the pond, this thing's getting huge publicity. The attendance was huge, and, you know, even the Queen of England herself asked to be informed of the results of the match by her son, even though boxing was completely illegal at the time, but I'll get back to that in a little bit. Now, a fight went on for two hours and 27 minutes, which would be uh, 49 three-minute rounds uh, by today's standards and uh, 42 rounds by the standards of those days. Um, but, you know, there was a melee towards the end of the fight. Basically, from all the accounts I've read, Heenan was dominating uh, Sayers, but Sayers was extremely durable and Sayers was leveling a heavy degree of punishment on Heenan's face um, throughout the fight. By the end of the fight, Heenan was basically blinded and um, disfigured, and Sayers had a broken arm and was uh, pretty much also beaten to a pulp, but he could still see. So the advantage was had been throughout the whole 42 rounds, had been in Heenan's favor. He had knocked Sayers down. A whole bunch of times but Sayers would always get up and he had amazing powers of recovery um, Sayers was using stick and move type tactics he was using head movement to, to keep away from uh, uh, Heenan's long jab um, and basically it was one of the most brutal displays that anybody has ever seen in the ring there are paintings uh, that were done of each guy after the fight, which show the huge amount of disfigurement to these guys' faces. Uh, significant, other significant things in this fight was probably that it was the last great bare knuckle fight of this period for England, although it shifted to the United States after this with the bare knuckle. This fight was uh, one of the last major, probably the last major fight that was fought under the revised London Prize Ring ru Rules of uh, 1853. 
and um, this fight was a major inspiration for the parliament to decide to uh, ask for a new set of rules w to be written, which ended up being the um, Marcus of Queensberry rules, which I believe came out in 1865, uh, but we'll get into that later. Uh, these London Prize Ring rules were, were still used for quite some time after this, though, uh, in the United States of America. I mean, um, most of John L. Sullivan's career was fought under the London Prize Ring rules, um, you know, the, the revised London Prize Ring rules. And um, so you can see that it didn't just end right after this, but in England, this basically wiped out bare-knuckle boxing. This fight was so brutal. And in the end, what happened was that the police came, they raided it, um, and when Heenan, who, who had been winning for most of the fight, saw the police coming, he took Sayers' head and tried to choke him against the ropes. Of course, they're in England, so Sayers has a lot of uh, uh, followers there. They cut the rope so he can't be choked. The ropes fall down, the ref leaves, he runs off. I mean, it, it, it's an unbelievable scene of, of um, chaos. I mean, when you, when you take a super fight, and this, by the way, was the first fight, I believe, that was ever to be called in advance of the fight, the fight of the century. It was the fight of the century in, in the sense of the drama, the blood, the action that people saw. Were these guys as, as skilled as uh, Molyneux and Cribb? No, they were not, in my opinion. I'm sure there are people who would debate that, but I, I say no, um, they were not. And no, this was not the first international title fight because you had Molyneux versus Cribb already. Um, but this is the first international title fight to receive equal publicity on both the East Coast of, of America or throughout America and in Great Britain. So it was a hugely significant super fight. And uh, sadly, um, both guys, after taking a brutal beating, wanted to continue, but there was just too much. Uh, the ref left. The police came in, you know, and they tried to keep the fight going for an additional five rounds, but it was no more than basically a brawl where Heenan was trying to fight off, you know, fans and, and, and stuff like that. So basically it ended in a draw. They ended up giving both guys a belt after because it was such a great action-packed adventure. And they become very good friends. They go on a tour of exhibitions you know, recounting the tale of the fight, and they both die very, very young, um, uh, never again rising to the level of um, of boxing skill that they had in that ring. In other words, they both beat the other guy's prime out of them, but uh, definitely, definitely a super fight, possibly the most significant one I've done so far uh, in certain ways. Um, uh, and uh, just one that's real fun to research and one that's been basically forgotten almost more than any of the other ones I've done. So that's about it um, for Sayers versus Heenan. I'll put a bunch of links in the description box for you guys to get more information. And um, there's actually an account, a round by round of account of the fight that you guys can check out, and I'll post a link to that too. Thanks for listening, and I'll be back again with number 12, which will either be uh, Hire versus Ambrose or a fight that was suggested to me by Jay Dill, which was Patty Ryan versus Cobb. I have to look into both of those a little bit more to determine which ones. I think are maybe, um, you know, truly super fights or not. Maybe both, maybe neither. We'll have to see. But thanks for the suggestion, Jay, and I will um, catch you guys on the next one. Bye.